Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we're going to be talking about a very important compound, a compound that has been asked by many people to cover. And I just want to give a caveat that this is video number 63 in a long series named Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. And if you're new to joining us, we welcome you. But this may be a very difficult place to start because we are really in the weeds here, talking about very specific compounds and very specific ways in which these compounds work. And in particular, the compounds we've been sharing for the last several weeks have been working on glutamine uptake and utilization, either transporters or enzymes. And most recently, we've been talking about this important glutamine cysteine antiporter called SLC7811. So if you're new to the channel, again, welcome, but you may be better served by going back slightly or even the beginning of the series and there's a video named How Metabolic Therapy Checkmates Cancer. And that could be some place where you could potentially start and get a little bit of a background to what is going on at this point in the series. So I'm going to be covering a lot of different compounds. And because these compounds work in various ways, I may cover something like, let's say, resveratrol or curcumin in a variety of different ways because it has different mechanisms of action that are important to us and some of which also are important to us, but don't have necessarily direct relation to glucose or glutamine. But the compound that I'd like to talk about today is something that people have been asking for for a while, and that is artemisinin. And artemisinin is something that people know about in the context of being an anti-malarial nutraceutical medication used in various parts of the world. And we're going to dive into that today. So the first paper that I'm highlighting here is just going to be giving us a background of what this is. So it's titled artemisinin and its derivatives as potential anti-cancer agents. And it says here that artemisinin is a natural sesquiterpene lactone obtained from the traditional Chinese medicinal herb artemisia anula. Artemisinin and its derivatives share an unusual endoperoxide bridge and are extensively used for malarial treatment worldwide. In addition to anti-malarial activities, artemisinin and its derivatives have been reported to exhibit promising anti-cancer effects in recent decades. In this review, we focused on the research progress of artemisinin and its derivatives with potential anti-cancer activities. The pharmacologic effect, potential mechanisms, and clinical trials in cancer therapy of artemisinin and its derivatives were discussed. This review may facilitate the future exploration of artemisinin and derivatives as effective anti-cancer agents. So this is a schematic of the artemisia anula plant. And depending on the type of chemical modification, we're going to see two main derivatives that are annotated in the medical literature. And that is going to be dihydroartemisinin and artizunate. So again, like most of these chemical compounds, they have multiple pleiotropic mechanisms of action of how they work as being anti-cancer agents. But given that we're in this glutamine micro series and specifically talking about SLC7A11, that's how we're going to approach artemisinin today. So the first paper is titled Artizunate inhibits the growth of insulinoma cells via SLC7A11 GPX4 mediated phareptosis. And it says here that artemisinin or ART, which is short for artizunate, suppresses the growth of insulinoma both in vitro and in vivo. Insulinoma cells treated with ART revealed signs of ferroptosis, including increased lipid peroxidation, diminished glutathione levels, and ascending intracellular iron. Notably, ART-treated insulinoma cells exhibited a decline in expression of catalytic component solute carrier family 7-member 11 SLC7A11 and glutathione peroxidase 4, GPX4. So what is this exactly saying? And it's probably best served by the subsequent pictures that I'm going to show. But essentially, as we talked about in prior videos, there are several steps that lead to ferroptosis. There's going to have to be the cysteine-glutamine exchange, which brings cysteine into the cell. And when combined with glutamate and glycine, we can construct the chemical glutathione. So this derivative of artemisinin is blocking the uptake of the cysteine required through this SLC7A11. Then the glutathione has to be recycled continuously 
by the help of glutathione peroxidase, in this case, glutathione peroxidase 4. And it's been shown that artemidazine also affects that enzyme as well and downregulates its expression and activity. That's going to lead to a susceptibility to oxidative stress. Then, because ferritin and iron is very tightly coupled in cells because of this very reason, artemisinin, and in this case, artesunate, is affecting the iron storage within cells and allowing for ferroptosis to happen at multiple steps. Pretty cool. This next paper is talking about another derivative we've talked about, dihydroartemisinin, induced ferroptosis and acute myeloid leukemia links to iron metabolism and metallothionine. And it says here that artemisinin is an anti-malarial drug that has shown anti-cancer properties. Recently, ferroptosis was reported to be induced by dihydroartemisinin, DHA, and linked to iron increase. In the current study, we determined the effect of DHA in leukemic cell lines on ferroptosis induction and iron metabolism and the cytoprotective effect triggered by leukemic cells. We found that treatment of DHA induces early ferroptosis by promoting ferritinophagy and subsequent iron increase. Furthermore, our study demonstrated that DHA activated zinc metabolism signaling, especially the upregulation of MT, metallothionine. Supportingly, we have shown that inhibition of MT2A and MT1M isoforms enhance DHA-induced ferroptosis. Finally, we demonstrated that DHA-induced ferroptosis alters glutathione pool, which is highly dependent on MT's driven antioxidant response. Taken together, our study indicated that DHA activates ferritinophagy and subsequent ferroptosis in AML, and that MTs are involved in glutathione regenerating and antioxidant response. So AML, or acute myeloid leukemia, is a very terrible disease. The acute leukemias are fast growing and dangerous. And this DHA, which remember is not the DHA found in, in omega-3 fatty acids, this is dihydroartemisinin. And just like in the prior study with artazunate, DHA or dihydroartemisinin also has very similar effects on upregulating iron storage, making iron more available to these cancer cells and downregulating the glutathione production and recycling needed to maintain redox homeostasis. So both of these compounds have very similar effects on making cancer cells more susceptible to ferroptosis. The next paper is titled, Dihydroartemisinin inhibits the proliferation, colony formation, and induces ferroptosis of lung cancer cells by inhibiting PRIM2 SLC7811 axis. And it says in conclusion, our study suggested that DHA, remember that's the acronym for dihydroartemisinin, inhibited the proliferation, colony formation, and enhanced cell death and induced ferroptosis of lung cancer cells by inactivating this PRIM2 SLC7811 axis. Loss of PRIM2 induced ferroptosis might be developed into a novel therapeutic method in lung cancer therapy. And then lastly, another study just recently published in May of 2024 titled Dihydroartemisinin Induced Ferroptosis in T-Cell Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia Cells by Downregulating SLC7A11 and Activating ATF4 CHOP Signaling Pathway. And it says here that mechanistically, the effect of DHA on ferroptosis was partly mediated by downregulating SLC7A11 and upregulating ATF4 CHOP Signaling Pathway, which is associated with ER stress, endoplasmic particulum stress. These results indicated that DHA may induce ferroptosis in this T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, cell lines, and could represent a promising therapeutic agent for treating T-ALL. Again, acute leukemias are very fast growing and terrible in general. So let's look at some pictures. What do we say? Help understand what's actually going on here. So this is from the most recent paper, the one about T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells. And what's saying is that in this particular cell line, DHA is having an effect at lowering the available SLC7A11 or this cysteine glutamate antiporter that helps bring in cysteine and create the necessary glutathione to help protect against oxidative stress, lipid peroxidation, and ferroptosis. In addition, it's creating an ER stressor, endoplasmic reticulum stressor that upregulates this ATF4 CHOP pathway which blocks glutathione peroxidase 4 from being made and recycled and regenerated 
which ultimately leads to ferroptosis in a, in a different way. Pretty cool. Then I want to take us back to some of these other models we've seen. So this is the lung cancer model where we see that dihydroartemisinin is blocking this SLC7A11 glutamine antiporter. Now, again, this is a very simplistic graph. This could be showing that this dihydroartemisinin and artizunate are actually blocking the expression of this protein. So therefore, the expression of SLC7A11 may not be allowing the protein to be translated into a protein and actually uh, attached to the outside of the cell, but it's downregulated. So there's less of this available. So therefore, less cysteine is getting into the cell. And then as a double whammy for this lung cancer model, dihydroartemisinin or DHA is also blocking glutathione peroxidase 4 activity, therefore leading to a increased propensity for lipid peroxidation and oxidative stress to happen and ferroptosis. And then furthermore, it also has effects on iron as well. So DHA is also affecting the iron pool and allowing for more iron to be available for when we have less glutathione made and glutathione peroxidase activity, we have a better chance of having lipid peroxidation and ferroptosis within these cancer cells. Pretty cool. It's actually kind of a triple whammy. We have, we're blocking SLC7A11, we're blocking glutathione, and we're upregulating within cancer cells iron availability so it can be oxidized participate in the Fenton reaction and lead to ferroptosis. And then I want to also show in our classic graphic here that we've seen in every video talking about glutamine uptake and glutamine utilization, that it is working on this SLC7A11. So I suspect that at this point of the video, you understand why people are interested in me talking about artemisinin and its derivatives, dihydroartemisinin and artizunate for the metabolic approach to cancer. It makes sense because it's having profound effects on glutamine utilization, as well as glutathione synthesis and regeneration, leading cancer cells to be more susceptible to ferroptosis and lipid peroxidation. So it makes sense. As I stated at the beginning of the video, most of these compounds, whether it be curcumin or resveratrol, or in this case, artemisinin, have pleiotropic effects, and we will touch on those other effects at a later date. But since we're talking about glutamine, glutamine uptake, glutamine utilization, and ferroptosis, this seems to be an appropriate time to talk about that. If you like videos like this, please like, share, subscribe. If you have people who you know could utilize this information, please share it with them. And until next time.